What is that in sync in a minute? <laughs> a very good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, it's good to be here right after the um, the Easter break, and, um, and 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 then try to get everyone together again and talk about the different issues that we are all interested in in different ways, uh, so that we can learn from each other. And one of the things that we are going to do um, in terms of at the lab itself, disruptive bites, possibly once or twice twice a month where we are going to spend about one hour and talk about different issues and invite different speakers so that we can have a good discussion on the different issues. And today we are privileged to have four speakers for the um, disability, accessibility and enabling technologies. Um, so we, we can sort of see the different perspectives from the different work that um, the four speakers have been doing for the past few years, really. So I think, I think, I think, I think, I think it's good to get everyone together and then talk about such issues. Um, the first speaker will be Paul Doyle, um, who is uh, the the Access uh, Research and Development Manager from Harvard College, and he has got about 15 year experience in the area. So it would be good to sort of like find out more about the things that you've been doing in the school. And we've got Lawrence Howard from Hands Free Computing and he's got a lot, a lot of experience in the use of speech technology. And we've got Deborah Jackson, who is going to talk about the initiatives that we have at the university, which would be good so that uh, even though we are from one university, sometimes it's quite difficult to know and find out about what we do at the university itself. And we've got Catherine, as well as Lynn Clowder, who are actually uh, involved in a project which is called Swing. And, um, Swing has done uh, quite a lot of work in terms of trying to support um, disabled um, students um, in Morocco and Egypt. And, and Egypt. And this project has been, has been extended into another project, which, which is called Muse, um, which is based in Chile and some, some of the other countries. So I think um, we can start with Paul. Um, we can have so about 10 to 15 minutes each, okay. and then towards the end, uh, towards the end, we, we, we can have the um, question and answer so that um, everyone can sort of um, get questions from the audience. And uh, the uh, people on the uh, streaming as well can actually ask questions and uh, we can try and uh, get them answered. Okay, thank you. All right. Is this the one? Yeah. Hoist by, I'm here to talk about technology. <laughs> First thing that I do, hoist by my own petard. There we go. Think about my wife, and she said, take your hands out of your pockets. <laughs> okay. Yay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? I do tend to mumble, so if I do start mumbling, please say, you know, ramp up the volume a little bit. I'm Paul Doyle, I'm from Herald College. Has anybody heard of Herald before? Yes. Yeah? Okay, so this slide's a bit meaningless. <laughs> uh, I'll just give you a bit of an introduction to Herald College. We're based in Tile Hill, uh, it's in Coventry, uh, and it was uh, opened in 1971 as an alternative to the um, rural colleges that were supporting youngsters with disabilities before that particular project. So uh, Herald's basically based in a, uh, a large urban setting. Um, we're not a specialist college, although a lot of people think that we are. We're a, um, an integrated college. That, so that basically means we support people across the pan-disability spectrum, but also we support students with, with no special needs at all. Um, as a consequence, um, because we've no specialism, we meet lots and lots of students with lots and lots of different needs. Um, in fact, some of the students that we support are individuals with, I, th I suppose what we call sort of some of the physical disabilities, muscular dystrophy, uh, cerebral palsy, acquired <laughs> brain injury. Increasingly, we're finding students with social, emotional and behavioral difficulties, more and more students on the autistic spectrum. Um, I think from a, 
an inclusion perspective, what we're finding is that many of the students that we would have called our bread and butter students, students with uh, mobility issues, are mainstreaming. And, and that's got to be a good thing, really. A lot of the students that we would have seen before uh, are finding themselves being fully supported in a, in a, in a, in a standard FE setting. Um, as I said, many of the students that we support at Heroward um, through many, well, 22 uh, plus professional services that we offer um, also use assistive technology. And are, are we happy with the term assistive technology? Because I'm, I'm be really beginning to realise that in, the, in some of the work that we've been doing with some of our other partners is uh, we talk about assistive technology and people have a perspective of what that is. So if you're working in education, you might think it's something to do with accessing ICT. So uh, like voice recognition technologies or screen magnification technologies or text-to-speech technologies. From a heroic perspective, we look at assistive technology in, in the fullest sort of uh, spectrum. So from moving and handling equipment in the residences, uh, feeding equipment for our students in the refectory to some of the ICT access technologies that we, we tend to use. There's an increasing use now of eye gaze based technologies. Has anybody seen some of the the technologies that are being sort of promoted. Um, I will say from a personal perspective, eye gaze is a, um, a very useful tool, but it's not an answer to everybody's problems. I think because it's innovative and because it's new, uh, people tend to think of it as the first port of call when, re you know, when meeting somebody's needs. It's the right tool for the right job, but there are lots of other jobs out there. It's not necessarily the right tool. So we've been using assistive technology since 1971 um, and as a consequence I think as an organisation we've got quite a good idea of what it actually does and what it doesn't do. Um, we use this type of uh, the definition for assistive technology. It's any product or service designed to enable independence for disabled and older people. I'll give you an example, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I'll give you an example sort of when we talk about any technology, voice recognition technologies were originally a productivity tool but they do have an application for individuals with mobility issues. So if you can't use a keyboard or you can't even see a keyboard, voice recognition technology, which was once a standard, I suppose say productivity tool, has an application there. So Heroid has never really had uh, a prescriptive idea of what an assistive technology could, be, could and should be. Uh, so we've used different alternative um, yeah, methodologies and technologies to provide access opportunities for our students. But in the process of doing that, as I manage the, um, the access centre at, at Heroward, uh, which is an assessment service. We have a team of about four assessors who provide uh, assessments for students who are moving into HE. You heard, has, any, has everybody heard of the Disabled Student Allowance, DSA? Well, my primary objective, my primary role is managing uh, uh, an assessment centre of uh, three outreaches for Heroward. So we, we're, we're fully immersed in sort of the assessment and provision process in relation to assistive technology. Um, Likewise, because of um, the other hat that I wear in terms of access, um, I, I manage the assessment service for our internal students. So we've got, you know, we're fully immersed in the AT world. One of the things that I learned very, very quickly was assistive technology is not just shiny hard or software stuff. It's stuff that people will want to use in a context that means something to them. And I think the title of my uh, presentation is, is about it's not what it is and does, it's about what it means as well. And I think one of the things that we've learned as an organisation is that if you don't get that aspect right, you might as well not spend the money on the assistive technology. So I've got a, a model there of what we call the ICF, the International Classification on Functioning Disability and Health. Mm -hmm. Trips off the tongue. Yeah. But, it, but it really does sort of... I, Sort of exemplify what you know where we've gone wrong we've crashed and burned as an organization but where we get it right as well so the example that we, uh, we, we've done we've created there is, is written in uh oh gosh come on there, widget symbols um so that people can understand what we're actually talking about in terms of you know the the levels of understanding regarding the icf an example would be um some of the students that we see we were providing technologies for them, but if it's not an appropriate technology, they'll walk away from it, both physically and metaphorically. An example I can sort of call to mind is we had a young lady who had a communication aid, uh, very expensive communication aid funded through the NHS, and she was a very pink young lady. Her wheelchair was pink, all of her outfits were pink, her room was pink, everything was pink, and then we provided her with a black communication aid. Uh, 
And that was just enough. It was the domino that we needed to tip to stop her from using that technology. Really what we should have done was realize that this is a person who's going to have a piece of technology in front of them 17 hours a day or 16 hours a day. And because it reflected her personality, if we didn't even think about how it was going to fit into her life, why should she want to accommodate it? And why should she want to use it? So from an engineer's perspective, I was thinking, it's in, it's on, it's worked, the batteries are charged, it outputs text, it outputs speech, oh, my job's completed. And she never used it. She just walked away from it. And it took a long time for me to realize that it's about what it means is just as important as about what it does. And we found, you know, from a from a, a, a herald perspective, that we can we can implement these type of interventions and back it up with human support. So we've crashed and burned, and I've said that before, but crashed and burned in a safe environment. Now, whether we were doing that in a wider community, I don't think I'd be very happy to to, to think that one through or, or to to address that issue with such a light touch. But you know, l learning through crashing and burning has been useful for, for us at Herald. But so why STEM and why Harry? One of the things that I wanted to talk about was STEM, um, science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, Harrowwood College has provided uh, a pretty sort of humanities-based program over the last sort of 10, 15 years. Originally, it was a vocational college, uh, but as the, as the government initiatives and the government uh, edicts changed, we moved more to a sort of a, 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 a qualifications-based program. Uh, uh, organization and as a consequence our qualifications tend to move towards the humanities one of the things we've learned in the last sort of four or five years is that stem is very poorly represented at, at a, on a heroid level but reaching out to wider um, specialist colleges we've also found that stem is very poorly represented in all specialist environments and it was a bit confusing for me because assistive <coughs> technology is a technology it's a stem subject and uh, when i used to talk to sort of students at Harrod, I'd say, what, what about STEM? And um, there was never any response because as soon as I mentioned STEM, the room was empty. Uh, so there was, a, there was, there was a, an intrinsic sort of um, mistrust of technology, I think, from our, from our students and our staff, to be honest with you. But there was a bit of a dichotomy there because a lot of the students that we were working with were sitting on STEM. If they were using an electric wheelchair, there was electronics to control it, there was battery power, there was you know, mechanical uh, engineering that has gone all into creating a solution that would enable somebody to move around independently. So to a certain degree, they were experts in their STEM. And so we started uh, a project about two years ago with, uh, I, I don't know if I can mention the, the term in this room, the University of Warwick. Are we allowed to say that? <laughs> about um, engaging young people in STEM. Uh, and the proposition was we were going to talk to them, uh, our students, about a, mat a matter that was intimate and uh, important to them. So the technologies that they were using, uh, the assistive technologies. So one of the things that I, one of the benefits that I have of working at Harrowood is that young people talk to me. I'm, I'm old enough and uh, been along ar around long enough for people to trust me and tell me what's crap. Um, and they do, they do. They think, well, this is rubbish, I don't like it. So we thought, well, let's utilise that. Let's utilize that, 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 I suppose, that honesty and say, okay, we know, we know what you don't like. You know, what, what do you like? What can, we, what can we do to help you change the appearance, the, the functionality of your assistive technology? Because ultimately, you guys are the experts. You've been using assistive technology. Many of you, many of the students that we support, have been using assistive technology since they were born. So they do have an opinion, they do have a knowledge and understanding and expertise. So we said, okay, why don't we use something useful like 3D printing to get that cycle of um, research and development and product development, let's shorten that cycle. Uh, because 3D printing promises that one moment you can have an idea and then you whip it up on your CAD package and then following um, hours or so, you end up with your artifact. And in many respects, it did, it did do that. But it, you know, in most things in life, it ain't as simple as that. So the project started, and we, we started engaging with the students and saying, okay, tell us what, what, where the issues lie in your, in your, um, in your, uh, your daily activities. And one of the issues was, uh, I don't know if you can see that, that um, CAD design, it's a bong, young man. And it was really interesting from his perspective because totally disengaged in STEM. 
didn't want to be in the class, didn't want to be involved in anything. Because uh, to a certain extent, we weren't communicating our, our project particularly well. Um, so it came down to, excuse the French, we said, what in life pisses you off? And he said, uh, the, so he said, well, he hadn't been asked that question before. He said, I'll tell you what pisses me off. He says, I go to a concert with some friends. and says, I, I, I go out for a meal or, or a, uh, uh, watch a band and I have a beer. And most beer comes in bottles. So he said, I put my beer bo bottle down and said, I put my uh, um, straw into the, uh, to the beer bottle. Now, beer tends to be fizzy. And all the bubbles started to um, sort of coalesce or co coagulate, or what's the word I'm looking for now? Stick to the bubble, uh, to the, to the uh, straw, and it would lift the straw out of the beer bottle. So Ollie would then have to spend the rest of the evening chasing his, uh, his straw. So everyone would be absolutely hideously drunk except him, because he'd, he'd still have his beer. So the idea uh, was that you know, he had a problem with, you know, with that particular issue. So we sat down with him and we designed a bung that would hold his straw in a position that he could have a drink. The idea was then to say to him, look, there's STEM. You've, ad you've addressed an issue that you find important, that's personal to you. But it's not about the, the, the technology, it's about addressing the issues that you feel are need needing to be addressed. And then almost at the end of the process, uh, has everybody seen The Wizard of Oz? Yeah, when you pull it away and it's the man with the, at the ear, we were saying, look, ta-da, that's STEM. You think you've done something that's not STEM related, but by being involved in this program, you've actually got something that means something to you, but you're using a, um, you know, uh, a technology, you're using a, a, a way of thinking that actually relates to you know, uh, the subjects that you've previously thought were, were you know, no-go no areas. <clears throat> and so, it, to a certain extent, we did have some good, success, you know, some great success with our students. But one of the things that we did learn, which I think from our, from our perspective was really quite interesting, was that our students could tell us what was rubbish. And we did some really interesting things. You know, um, that chappy there looks quite like a, 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 um, an artifact that's been dug up from a Roman dig, but it's actually a titanium fork. And it's a titanium fork that's been printed by an organization that's working with us so that an individual with um, uh, spinal muscular atrophy can hold a, uh, a, fo a fork independently. Now, you might think, well, holding a fork independently is not necessarily a, a bit of a game changer here. But this is a 30-year-old man who was being fed by his mum. And it was really important to him to be able to have a fork and be able to pick up food himself because he will not go out. He will not go out to social events or, 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 or to a restaurant because he doesn't want to be fed. His condition has now reached a point whereby he's wholly reliant when he hasn't got that type of artifact available to him on somebody feeding him. So you know, the, the, the technology is very, very simple, but it's about what it means. It's about re-establishing a sense of his own personal well-being and se sense of uh, power, really. So, you know, the, the project itself was relatively successful. <laughs> ah, I won't go there yet. Um, until up to a point. And one of the things that we, 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 we really, we as an organization learned, and I think the guys at Warwick learned, was that um, whilst our students were very, very good at telling us what was rubbish, one of the things that they didn't, couldn't do and, and really, when we started to investigate it, well, why should they be able to do this? Was they weren't able to articulate how they were going to make it better. Because as we all know, we all know when something's not right, when we're com uncomfortable or when, when we're cold or when we're, you know, we all know what we don't like. But asking somebody who's never been involved in STEM, and we've, again, one of the, uh, another outcome that we found was that through all of the specialist um, education that they had, there wasn't a focus on STEM. Uh, numeracy and literacy, yes, but some of the STEM areas that we, you know, we're, we're seeing sort of delivered in, in primary sec and secondary schools in the, in the mainstream just weren't actually um, were given any major sort of precedence. And so then asking students, sorry, one moment, then asking students, sorry, to um, articulate that you know, when they've never been given their grounding in that was really, really sort of quite unfair. So the, the initial assumption that, yes, they know what's wrong, was, 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 was solid. The, the final assumption that they know how to articulate it was not. But what 3D printing did to us and did for us was enable us to identify a way of means of facilitating that discussion. It's not right, it's not the right size. Pretty much you know, an hour or two afterwards, we could have a different size for it. Tell me what you think about it. It was a great facilitator 
the initial assumption was that we would get students to do things for themselves. What we really learned was that what we needed to do was involve them in the design process, but give them something that they could physically hold and criticize or critically appraise. And then our final comment for this um, um, particular portion, um, we've realized that by engaging individuals in a discussion about themselves, it had applications that were far wider. So in terms of service delivery, if somebody's looking at work, living independently and then talking about what care they need, all of a sudden they realized that their voice was an integral component to you know, things other than STEM, other than you know, what, what, what don't you like, in terms of planning, where would you want to be in so many years? You know, it just enabled their voice to be heard and also gave them an opportunity to realize that that was, you know, that A, their right, and B, you know, it made our lives easier. If you tell me what you want and we deliver it, then everybody's happy. Okay. Thank Excellent. you for your time. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, Jennifer. Magic, magic box. One, two, one, two. Yeah, no, it's quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. I feel like Sylvester, I want to sing. Do you watch the voice? No, I don't know. maybe I should. Yeah. So what I'm talking about today isn't whiz bang technology. So if you're expecting all the things these guys have been talking about, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is service. So um, Faye and I work in the disabilities office, so we work with our students that have got disabilities. Similar to what Paul's already said, actually, we're noticing a change in the students that we're getting. So we're not getting many physically disabled students anymore. What we are getting is masses and masses of autistic students. So the biggest thing for them is transition. You can all remember when you went to university, it was really difficult, wasn't it? So if I can press my button, it's really difficult for anybody. Actually, it's even more difficult when you've got to arrange everything else that you've got to arrange. So you might never have cooked for yourself. Mum's always been that well, she's not there anymore. Who helps you with that? So that's why we came up with kind of a series of transition events. It's kind of happened over kind of three, four years, really organically. We've added to it. We've taken away. We've tried something new. Um, you might think, why is this innovative? It's really obvious. We're one of the only universities to do it. It's really, really strange. So what do we do? So we arrange Move On Up. So Move On Up is, is one event and then Discuss is another event. So Move On Up is the first one. Okay, so Move On Up runs from January until, so it's four events, so June, July, and it runs as a series of information days for disabled learners. Now, when we say disabled learners, this could be somebody that's at Harrowwood that thinks they might want to go to university in two years' time. They can come to this. They can think, is this possible for me? Because a lot of students don't think it is. Or it could be somebody who's due to start in September. So it's a kind of mit hits everybody. So it's four transition days. Um, each day has a topic. And at the bottom, you can see the topics. So things from studying at CU. So what is the difference between what they're doing at college and what they expect to be doing at university? That can be the level of work. So they get to sample a lecture. So they might be sat in a class of 15. They're now in a class of 300. It's getting used to that. Um, it can be getting used to the terminology as well. So what does the word critically evaluate? How do you do all them things that we expect them to be able to? And they can't do. Looking at library tools, they come and have a look at this. They come and have a look at core and they come and have a look at Sigma as well. So it just gives them an idea of the supports available for them. And each day kind of follows that thing. Um, we try and do it quite informally because I think to it formally would scare them. But we don't want to do it too informally because then I think the thought of university would also scare them. We try and replicate what's going to happen in their day-to-day -day lives. So that's move on up. And then the next one is discuss. So that kind of, I can't even remember what it stands for now. We got some funding and we had to get some sort of acronym and that's what we came up with. I think it's disability students at CU summer school, something like that. Similar sort of thing. So same as move on up, really, really informal. We do limit this though to 20 students per summer school because otherwise if we go to 30, 40, it would be too much. Again, our students would get overwhelmed. It's a four day, three night residential. They stay in, they cook for themselves, they look after themselves, similar to what Paul was saying, in a safe environment. So if something goes wrong, one of us is there on the other end of a phone. Um, there's volunteers there with them as well. So they're usually current disabled students or current students that have got a real interest in working with disabled people. 
And as you can see, there's lots and lots of things that we got going on. It is really tiring. They go home at the end of that week thinking, oh my goodness, but they're prepared for Freshers Week because that is exactly what Freshers Week is like. We organize entertainment, they lead it. So we're like, you know, I'll request like Laser Quest or, or, or the cinema. They might not want to go and do that, but we put stuff in for them because if we don't, they won't do anything. They'll just go home into their rooms. Um, cool things that we do. So things like the budgeting task, rather than actually sitting them down in a classroom and teaching them, we actually give them 50 pounds and they have to budget the whole week. So that's quite innovative. It scares the living daylights out of them because they've got 50 pounds, it's got to last the week, but they do it. And what's the other one we do? We do another one, don't we? I can't remember. I'll have to have a look. Oh, cooking, we make them cook. But I don't think Faye's had the privilege of this yet. That's why we are all ready just in case anybody dies. But as of yet, we haven't killed anybody. We don't, we try and encourage them away from raw meat. I think that's the way to go with it. Um, it is a real giggle. Um, I think I've put up there, we do a lot of fun stuff because I think that helps them get used to the team that are around them. We don't seem like scary people that they can't talk to. So what are the benefits? So we were trying to brainstorm this this morning, weren't we, like frantically. Um, it helps them get used to university rules. I think that's a big thing. You know, the university is massive. You know, they need to get used to that and they need to get used to all the kind of little rules that we have and then we break and, and, and kind of things like that. Um, encouraged to apply for DSA. Paul's talked about that. That's where their support comes from. So if they haven't done it by September, it is quite late, but at least we can get them through that. Um, they get to know other students, which I think is really, really important. We get to know the students, sorry, and they get to know their issues, which then means we can disseminate that to the tutors. So if we know the student really well and know that maybe background noise is a big problem, we'd be able to let the tutors know that. And then with the applicants, they get to know um, us. So they get to know Faye and myself and the rest of the team. They also get used to the university. It's got to help. They already have friends, and we use that word because some of them won't call them friends or call them acquaintances, but they get to know other people. Um, induction weekend meetup. So you hear about them meeting up on induction weekend, which is lovely because they've got somebody to meet. Peer support, it starts that. And because of that, we have now have a social group called Friendly Faces, which kind of formed all because of what we've done. That's very much student led. We don't really get involved with it apart from the first couple of weeks of term. And I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Can that actually use that or? It's mic. Oh, I've got a mic. Oh, got a mic. Yeah. Yeah, it's right. Yep. Yep. Let me set this one up. Okay. Let's go the back of this. Oh, is it USB or? That's my headset. We are for. Do you have HD? God knows. Uh, have I got the thing around the back? Yes. <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> So um, while, while, while we were waiting for the technical thing to be sorted out, um, Lawrence is, is, is involved in one, one of the projects that, that we are working on, which is called the um, Beaconing. Um, it is funded by the EU Commission. It's like a three-year project with 15 partners. So what we are trying to do in this project is trying to extend uh, learning experience um, from a classroom setting into the outdoor and into personal space. Um, and we are trying to, to support STEM. And we are also trying to support um, students with um, mild to moderate disability. Um, this is where our friend here, Paul, is going to get involved as well in terms of being the stakeholders um, so that we will be able to understand the needs and, and how we can actually support students with um, disability. And the fact that we are going to also work with Catherine and Lynn Clouder as well as Deborah Jackson in trying to understand how, how can we sort of learn from the experience that you, that you have done in your own projects and how that, that, that will inform what we do as well. So they got, we've got about four different guys who are actually working on this project. So hopefully they are taking notes and, and, and see what they will need to find out in, in, the, in the next few months. So we're good? Yeah, I think we're good to go. Yeah. Okay.
Well, thank you for the introduction, Sylvester. Yeah, so um, what I was going to do, because I know we haven't got a great deal of time, was I just thought I'd run through a really quick PowerPoint, which just tells you a little bit about hands-free computing, who we are and what we do. And then I was going to do a demonstration of Dragon, naturally speaking, just so you can see the kind of thing working. That's an example of one of many types of technology that could help people with disabilities. And it was really interesting hearing what Paul was saying earlier on, um, also about Coventry University, about the kind of support that's here for students. I think probably the most fundamental thing is that someone's assessed properly. <laughs> yeah. Because if you haven't got the right provision in place for them, then it's going to be very difficult for them to succeed. And then people need training on how to use this kind of thing. So, you know, what do we do? Basically, hands-free computing is really about using technology and training to help remove the barriers that different disabilities can actually present um, and make life easier for them and enable them to perform. Um, We've been trading now for 19 years. Um, we work nationally. I've got a team of trainers located all throughout the UK, literally from Middlesbrough down to Bristol, to Manchester, lots in Birmingham and so on. Um, work all over the country. Although hands-free computing might sound like we only deal with speech recognition software, and we are a Dragon Nuance premier partner. We deal with partners with many other software providers as well that assist people with disabilities. Um, I've kind of said that, so we provide assistive technology, training, um, strategy coaching as well. And sometimes the, these are to provide training on the kind of skills that technology can't necessarily help with. And this can be things like confidence and self-esteem and so on. Um, just a slide that I found. Yeah, this where a, a, we've done a lot of work with employers through a scheme called Access to Work, which provides grants for people in the workplace with a disability to help them overcome their disability so they can work effectively. And it's very similar to the DSA, which is there for students. Um, and we do operate within the DSA as well. But many employers get it wrong, where they say, okay, well, we've got to have a fair selection scheme. So, you know, here you've got a picture of, you know, a bird and a monkey and an elephant. And so it says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Well, <laughs> Is climbing a tree part of their job? Is it relevant to them? Um, you know, in some cases, well, it, it might be important to them. Well, with a ramp or with a ladder, then they probably could climb it. Um, Albert Einstein said, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will believe its whole life that it's been stupid. Yeah. And that, I do find, is... is um, a common issue that we have to deal with people with disabilities, particularly those who are dyslexic, which are quite a high proportion of the people we deal with, where they are intelligent and they've often got way above our average IQ, but they've been told all their life they're stupid. Yeah, and it's overcoming that kind of barrier that could be a real issue, providing technology can open up some doors, but you've still got some historic stuff that you have to deal with as well. We've got our own version of Dragon software that we've developed specifically for people in the workplace, and it's got lots of voice commands to link it with all the other assistive technologies out there, the stuff that reads back to, the mind mapping software, and so on. Um, and basically, speech recognition software such as Dragon, it can help you. You know, you can talk to the computer instead of typing. It can help you get your ideas down really quickly. So you've got you know poor working memory. One of the problems that a lot of dyslexics will have is not only the problems with literacy and spelling and so on, but can also be making sentences make sense because they start a sentence one way and by the time they've typed the way through it, they've lost their train of thought and it ends up as something else. And you read it afterwards, you think, what's that all about? Speech recognition software won't necessarily eliminate the problem, but it can reduce the impact of it because you can get your thoughts down quicker and you don't have to worry about the spelling. There's all sorts of other technologies out there. Typically, a lot of the stuff that we tend to provide tends to be stuff that can read back to you. So it could be programs like Text Help, Read and Write. It could be programs like Claro, and they do a whole plethora of other things, thesauruses, grammar checkers, putting colored overlays onto the screen and so on. Mind mapping could be really helpful. Um, you know, not everyone thinks in an ordered and linear way. People think spatially, and it's being able to capture those thoughts as they come and then put them into order afterwards. And mind mapping applications can really help with that. Um, I've kind of said a bit about <laughs> that. Um, workplace strategy coaching. Um, you know, this can really help people as well. And for some people, they only need technology. For some people, they only need the strategy um, training. The strategy training 
typically we tend to find we provide it to people who are suffering from, you know, who, who are dyslexic, dyspraxic, have things like ADHD, um, Asperger's, um, and the sorts of areas that we'll help with are things like organization and prioritization, workload management, short-term memory, concentration, spelling, confidence, communicating needs. That's another big thing. You know, people are thinking, oh, I don't really understand. What do I do? And, you know, do they just sit quietly and hope it will come to them? Are they interrupting every 30 seconds? It's helping them find that kind of balance in a way that works for them in their environment. Um, now, trainers um, all use the principle of lifelong learning. So the idea behind that is that, you know, after the trainer's left them, the person just doesn't remain the static level. They've got the skills to be able to build on what they've learned and to keep learning. Um, I'll just cut kind of testimonials, you know, customers have said about us, no, this isn't so relevant to students, but, you know, if I'd realised from the beginning that this form of technology and learning was available, my life would have been less stressful. All the information was relevant to my particular needs as in my working life and both confidence and performance. That was a care manager at Kent County Council. Um, I've learned to collate my thoughts using the mind mapping spider <laughs> system, which is my preferred style. I was anxious about undertaking more academic work later this year, but my trainer showed me how to export the spider diagram to Word. Invaluable, thank you. And that was a skills learning zone teacher, I think, at Liverpool Community Health NHS Trust. So that's the end of my PowerPoint. What I thought I'd do now is give you a quick demonstration of Dragon, just so you get a feel for how it works. A fairly <laughs> standard sort of demo that I tend to do. Um, there's a variety of different microphones available. This is a headset microphone. It's noise cancelling, so it should filter out background noise. Um, the way you tend to wear it is on your head, obviously, because it's a headset. And um, position it fairly close to your mouth. And it should only take sound from this direction, generally. Um, what I'll do for the purpose of this demo is I'll switch the microphone on and off with the keyboard. But you can use commands such as wake up and go to sleep to do the same thing if you've got dexterity issues. So what I'll do is I'll just open up Microsoft Word, change the font size, start Microsoft Word. Set size 16. My name is Lawrence Howard and I'm dictating using Dragon Naturally Speaking directly onto my laptop computer, full stop, new paragraph. With Dragon, naturally speaking, you can dictate at approximately 160 words directly into almost any Windows application, full stop, new paragraph. The minimum system specification for Dragon, naturally speaking, is as follows, colon, new paragraph, Pentium 4 processor, new line, one gigabyte RAM, new line, Sound Blaster compatible sound system, New paragraph. And so, lo and behold, you know, I spoke. And what you'll notice is that I speak more at a kind of newscast kind of speed. And then onto the screen. If I went into true, full-flowing, conversational, umming and erring, the recognition accuracy would drop off. And then it would take you longer to complete everything. So it's finding the right pace for you. Um, but, you know, I've dictated straight into Word. If I want to edit it, well, I can still use the keyboard and mouse, you know, if I want to. I mean, that's just not a problem at all. Yeah, but if I wanted to do it all by voice, yeah, I can select words, select sentences, paragraphs, dictate over the top of them, change them. I'll just give you a couple of examples. So, um, select 160 words per minute. Select 160 words, set size 22, make that bold, make that blue, select dragon naturally speaking, two, make that red, select one gigabyte, four gigabytes, select minimum, recommended, move to bottom, 
So, you know, that's the sort of thing that you can do if you want to. But, and, and for some people, it, they'll do part of it by with the mouse and part of it by voice. It's fine, whatever combination works for you. But this is just a third input device. So you've got keyboard, mouse, and voice. Um, and it can be set up to put in standard bits of text or take you through into standard applications and so on. And these are called voice macros. And we can set those up or show the users how to set them up. And they can really save a lot of time. So the sort of thing might be... I don't know how it would relate to a student particularly, but supposing I was writing a letter um, and I'm always saying, should you have any further queries, please don't hesitate to contact me, blah, 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 blah. I can just say something like closing paragraph and it will write in the same thing. So closing paragraph. And it goes, the advantage of setting up those kind of things is you don't have to compose them. You don't have to think about you know, how it's going to be put together, it's quicker. And so, you know, if you've got literacy difficulties, you can just zap it down really quickly. And if you haven't got literacy difficulties, it's quicker anyway. Um, but we can configure it to do pretty much anything you could do with the keyboard and mouse from a sing single voice command. So if I was wanting to send this as an email, and we can also make the system simpler as well. So I want to send this as an email. The way I'll show in this demonstration isn't the way you probably do it in the real world, but it's just to show the kind of steps it can go through. I could say to it, you know, I've got a command set up where I can say email this to a particular person. And what it will do in this case is copy the text, open up Outlook, paste it in there and put in their email address. Um, and I'm just showing you that just so you can see that there's a massive range of things that you can do with it rather than necessarily saying this is a fantastic example. Of, of you know something that's really useful so email this to james and so what it's doing is it's just copied it it's opening up outlook and, um, Sorry, it's working a bit slowly, but um, the principle being, you know, you can see it's put in the email address, a subject title, and then I'll just dump in the text. <laughs> and just to prove it wasn't, you know, paper and think, it's even got the mistake in that I'd, I'd made when I was dictating, where I'd said 160 words per minute, and I haven't said that. So um, that's the sort of thing. So if you have any questions, by all means ask, or if not, we can save them up until the very end. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. It's okay. Now we have Catherine and Professor Lynn Cloud is going to sort of um, chip in. <laughs> oh, wait a Okay, um, time-wise, shall I take five minutes or so and then we still have time for questions? Do people have to leave at one? Will there be people who need to leave? Or can you stay on a little bit longer? Five, five or so minutes. I won't take too much longer. Um, so I am here just presenting on behalf of a number of colleagues who've been involved in SWING, um, which stands for Sustainable ways to increase higher education students' equal access to learning environments. Again, slips off the tongue very easily. Um, but really, um, a great project that was two years in length that completed just this January and was funded by Tempus um, and was a project that involved um, a number of European universities with North African university partners working together 
with this overall aim to make sure that students with disabilities had as, as equal access as possible to their education as non-disabled students. And our focus was on using accessible um, assistive technologies and the assistive technologies we are talking about are those to assist them in learning and navigating around campus. Um, and I guess we've got two years worth of material that I'm going to try and get across in five minutes, but really um, it was very much about thinking not only about the assistive technologies and how they would be of use to students, but really thinking about much wider infrastructural issues about how this was going to occur in the institutions. So we have ourselves, Coventry University, we had partners from Greece, from Italy, um, from Spain, Morocco and Egypt. So all higher education institutions, all working together with the idea that perhaps some of the um, European partners would be able to support and share some of what they had gone through in terms of understanding some aspects of assistive technologies to help our students and how that might help the North African partners think about how they might adopt some of those practices. So it was a sharing of practices, but by no means, I think, are we positioned on ourselves as experts because we realized, especially as we were in the project, that we're all in this journey of learning together and how to improve all our practices. Um, so just in terms of the, the overall aim of the project, about bringing together stakeholders. And I think in, for the SWING project, a focus was certainly originally and initially to work at the sort of strategic management level by getting um, heads of departments and vice chancellors to understand the importance of needing infrastructure in place to support these um, assisted technologies to bring into students. Um, and, you know, so there was important meetings held and lots of debating going on. Um, which ended going into political sort of arenas as well. So it was very much top down, I think, to start with in terms of its focus. Um, and this sort of way of looking at partnership, to understand that commitment from the universities involved, to address the issues, um, to get the cooperation from all the different stakeholders that were involved in these sorts of um, big institutions, you know, the public service, academic services, the professional services, there's all sorts of stakeholders involved to support this, um, um, as well as, importantly, the students themselves. And we talked already about students having a lot of knowledge themselves about what works for them and what's helping them. These are students who've already got through to higher education. So they've already thought of lots of strategies and ways in order to support their learning. And it's sort of thinking, well, what can they tell us then? Because this was about trying to change infrastructure and process within, within learning um, as, as much as it was to help inform these students about perhaps other technologies, other open software technologies that they might have access to to enhance their learning. Um, so there was a process, there was a number of work packages, um, there was a lot of meetings amongst all visits to each institution to look at what our individual practices were, who was doing what, visits to her with college were done, um, the partners came over to Coventry, and met with our students, talked with our students and, and looked at some of our practices, some of the technologies we're using. Um, because then it will be a case of the North African partners, so this is specifically the Moroccan and Egyptian partners, coming back to their own institutions and thinking, okay, what do we want to start looking at for our local needs and our local practices? Um, and there was this sort of roadmap of thinking about how can we start to build a framework that would support this type of journeying together. Um, and so just a visual there of, of some of the issues. So these are big partner discussions thinking about um, how we can guide this two-year plan of looking at what needs are, how to then think about ordering some of these equipments and tools, how to go about training staff, how to implement that, how to cascade that on with students' involvement, how to get that into, into policy and curriculum, all sorts of things to consider. It's very multidimensional. Um, and you can see we developed this um, assist accessibility model, these four pillars um, which recognise the importance of making sure students with disabilities are visible in higher education. I think for a lot, 
of the Egyptian and the Egyptian and Moroccan university they were thinking they didn't have very many students with disabilities and actually as they came to look at their students needs they realized there were more students on campus who did have needs I think the physically disabled students were predominantly the ones that were involved I mean we were thinking about this disabilities around mental disability you know all types of disability um, mental impairment and what have you but I, I think focus was predominantly around physical impairment um, but we were looking at not only the use of, uh, of the assistive technology but the actual uh, ways that that would be implemented into study how that would be implemented into thinking about careers and employability further down the line and the sort of look uh, th this sense of empowerment of students voice um, from feeling they were dependent somewhat on the academic staff and what they're able to access to having more empowered ability to de make decisions and inform others about what their needs were um, to, so growing independence in that sense in their studies um, the other big part of the project was about setting up accessibility centers for the Egyptian and Morocco universities there wasn't a go-to place there wasn't a sense of physical space of where students might get advice or be able to meet with other disabled students to talk about what their needs were. So another big part of the project, not only about the model and setting up a framework for practice, was thinking about physical space, where some of these new technologies could be housed, students could go and use them. But in setting up those centres, we had to employ staff and they had to be trained. And those then would have to think about how you would train the academic staff and make them aware of these sorts of centers and how they would direct and promote them to students. So um, a lot of issues around that um, and thinking around the training. So there were 10 modules that were developed. Um, I've left some copies of the final summary of the project. So please, if you're interested to know more, um, you can see the sorts of modules that were developed. So this is training for staff and students around the technology itself, but also um, practical assistive technology sessions, um, sessions, uh, modules that covered issues around employability, employment skills, global awareness. So a whole range of modules that were developed through SWING that then were used um, across these institutions. And you can imagine the journey we've gone on. It's not been smooth, it's not been linear, it's not a case of things just unfolding. Um, it's been a case of toing and froing and realizing that we're all in this together and that the European partners weren't trying to impose the westernized view on the Egyptian and Moroccan partners' practices. It was, how will this work with your local practice? You know, let's be open and have uh, you know conversations and um, not sort of try hide some of the difficulties that were being experienced because they were feeling they had to put on a good show when we would go and have visits. So I think it was trying to develop those partnerships um, and also looking at how we do needs assessment around assistive technologies. And the fact that employability and career advice was pretty much non-existent in the Egyptian and Moroccan H institutions. So that was a big gap to think about how to cater for and consider that. Um, and we recognise so much about the student voice. Um, and the importance of engaging them. They were certainly co-producers in many ways in trying to inform the staff about their needs. And, and in fact, instead of the training occurring for staff first and then being cascaded to students, students had the training and taught the academic staff. So it was, you know, look at who can teach who here about what our needs are and what support is required. And actually how we need more of a voice on campus, how we need a student union, how we need to be better integrated, how we need access into all subjects, not just able to study at humanities level, how we need practice placement opportunities to support our career ad advancement. So many things the students were telling us and telling their academic staff they needed. Um, so that contribution was immense. But what we've achieved has also been immense. I think there's been significant policy change in Morocco. Um, and uh, actually, at some of the dissemination events, we've had ministers from the, the um, local government. Um, and actually, they did change their policy. Um, and uh, there's now a law supporting funding um, to support students to access education and access assistive technologies. I mean, I've never been involved in a research project before that has changed policy in a country. So we're very thrilled about that. And in Egypt, definitely recommendations 
and the big Arab unions, which is another 22 countries have all been informed about the project. So these flagship institutions in Egypt and Morocco have really wanted to push out what they're doing um, to try and engage with other institutions and, and, and want to about the good work they're doing because they want to engage students to come and study with them. And it's all good for them, you know, and certainly good for our students. Um, so yes, but I, I think, you know, we've got to say we, we have learned so much about what work we have to do. We have so much to do in our own local practice to support our students. We need to be much better at how we disseminate our, our, our outputs and making them accessible and making sure they're braille and, and hands-free and all these technologies we're advocating. How are we equipping ourselves to equip each other to make sure this is integrated into our practices? So I think we need much more focus on this. And I, I guess in terms of, and finally, it is just the beginning again for us. And it's great that we've got the project News which is with South American partners to build on what we learned with SWING. I'm not involved directly in that project, but Gemma and Lynn are, and others may be in the room, but, you know, and, and Kate, there's so much that, you know, we've got to do, but we're learning all the time. So I think, just, add, just, just one thing, yeah. The importance of kind of top down, sorry, I'm usually quite loud anyhow. The importance of sort of top down and bottom up action. <laughs> You need to have the commitment from the top, but you also need the bottom up sort of action as well. And certainly the idea of the students, because the students really had no voice in Morocco and Egypt. And actually, one of the most powerful things from the project was that empowerment that once we got the students talking, it was absolutely phenomenal what they, you know, they knew exactly what their needs were, unlike you know has been said they actually knew what they needed they just didn't have access to it um so yeah that's all i want to add thank okay. you very much i think it's great it's been great to hear different perspectives from um the likes of those who are practicing it um and, and those who are doing research on it and those who are actually creating Technology, so we can see that a lot of different perspectives that need to be merged, so that we can learn uh, that you know the, the the different expertise, the different technologies that we have can be merged in such a way that it would create a context to how we can support um, students with disability. And um, yeah, thank you, thank you very much to all four. Um, so, any questions to any of our speakers? Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Well, mm, mm, the Italian situation is quite different from what we have here, that we don't have special schools, so inclusion is on the way. So what, what I'm most afraid is an, an integration approach in that you use the technologies to just bring up people to performance. Well, not. it was good that you touched on meaning. So it's not about making things work and making people be able to do just what other people do but everyone can contribute their meaning so my question is how much these technologies uh, uh, just do that so bring people up to performance and how much do this technology open spaces where the disabling uh, society has not entered so that's the potential to have spaces where the disabling uh, uh, policies and cultures have not entered so I don't know if I've been. <laughs> I think, from a Harrowwood perspective, what what we've learned is that the, that you're absolutely right. I mean, we've looked initially at uh, technology for function, uh, but function doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're answering all of the questions uh, that, that 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 person is posing to you. Um, I think. What we've also learned is, is, is uh, um, sorry, what's your name? Catherine. as Catherine was saying, is that sometimes we need to start thinking about it on a policy level because recognizing that that function isn't the the be all and end all, but actually inclusion is the be all and end all, uh, and enabling people to achieve what they're capable of achieving and recognizing that achievement is not necessarily on an individual or institutional level, but it's almost on the governmental level. If we're talking about attracting funding for for for, um, I mean, at the current moment we're talking about. Um, providing opportunities for our students to re-engage in employment. 
But the nature of that employment, the nature of the contribution that they can make is very prescriptive from government currently. And we need to engage with policymakers to say we need to broaden that out. We need to recognize the very real and valuable contributions that our individuals can make. But looking at the framework that you're currently adhering to, it, you know, it, it's doing them a disservice. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Hi, I'm Cathy Courtney. Um, it has interested me in the past that working, um, making life easier for people with disabilities also benefits a lot of people who don't have disabilities. So, for example, the provision of ramps, which then helps people with prams and suitcases and so on. Um, I would really like to see a focus also on what some of these technologies can, how some of these technologies can benefit people without disabilities say because of their learning styles or learning preferences so there might be a lot of people a lot of students who would like the voice recognition um, software and to bring to close that gap a bit more I think would be really nice and useful um, I think that's a really important point and I think the naming of the centres as accessibility centres was was in a way to open up um, those centres for anybody to use. Um, it wasn't about having a disability. I mean, I think a, a, a focus was that it would be a place to house lots of ideas and, and to promote um, ways of looking at what do we need on campus to support our learning. Um, but I think it, it was in an attempt to, it's a, it's a journey, I think, um, but to try and better integrate and also allow other students who might have been having to cover up or, or just struggle on to be able to feel they could, there wasn't anything to fear in trying to be honest about what was going on in their education because I, I think it was not talked about. Having a disability is, is something that means you're second class citizen and so to feel that there was nothing well i mean i think it will take a while for that to be overcome but to start those conversations where people can feel well i i could say actually could i have some help with this because i've been struggling so it was yeah from from yeah from whoever yeah and for staff for staff as well i mean it's great that on the on the on the team we had um, an academic from spain alicante university who is a wheelchair user herself so she was very much looking at her journey as an academic who'd had to fight systems in her own institution to, as a staff member to get support. Um, so, I mean, that's a whole other project too, <laughs> but it was great to have her insight. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, to me, the whole thing is about having a more inclusive society full stop. And that, that's not just about disability. It's about race, it's religion, it's everything. Yeah. Um, and really, I mean, a lot of these tools should be made available to everyone. And rather than people say, oh, I've got a disability, can I have some help? It's like, well, we've all got different abilities and different things we're better at or, or less good at. You know, I mean, I don't know, someone might be very good at music and someone else is very good at maths. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's just bringing tools together that can help enhance people yeah, and enhance their abilities rather than labeling them as having a disability. And a lot of people have hidden disabilities. They're not even aware of it. You know, so things like dyslexia, for example, where we're dealing with an increasing number of people with dyslexia, and you also mentioned about autism, and it's all on the same spectrum. You know, some of them don't even realize what the problem is. They just they only know this is how they are. They don't consider themselves as being disabled. So by bringing the tools into place that are available for them, letting them try things, they're not having to have a label. They're just finding something helps them a bit more. And that means, you know, peer support and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one, one, one of the things that we're trying to do in the beginning project as well, we, we are trying to create something that is to be used by everyone, regardless of whether you are disabled or not. The only thing that we can say is this, you know, what we're trying to create is will support per personalization. So it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, you know, whether you are disabled or, 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 or able, it's based on your 
preferences, the things that you need to make the system work and to make the system engaging type thing. Um, you know, uh, I think those are the things that we can actually think about so that when a disabled person is going to use the system, they don't feel like, oh, this is for me because I've got the disability, but they've got a choice to personalize it to make sure that you know it's working as how they want it to work, how it looks in terms of the aesthetics, so on, so on and so forth. Yeah, questions? Hi, my name is Tess Waring. I work here at the university, um, but I'm not an academic. And I'm just curious, quick question. How many people in this room have any sort of impairment that they're willing to share with anybody? Because I think I'm the only one in the room that is. Brilliant. That is just brilliant. It's all right. It's just, it's lovely to see because sometimes we're talking about people being inclusive, but it's nice to know they're included as well, if that makes sense. Because sometimes I feel a very lone voice. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, I'm Peter, um, a student here. Um, sorry, I came in late, but uh, from what I got at and looking on the screen, it's like uh, this project is uh, focusing on um, that higher education. Yeah, and uh, I'm wondering if there's anything like that in plan for um, other levels of education because i'm looking at how they get from i know there are so many different forms of or causes of disability but let's look at those let's say by birth or thing like how they get to that higher level to i mean benefit from some of these things so i'm just talking i mean whether there's something there for the like the junior schools and other things if there's any plans or projects or things like that so that we could also take it off. Because if you take this to my country in Ghana, for instance, you know, a lot of people with disability can't get to that level to enjoy what you're talking about. So you have to start from somewhere down there. So. I think, uh, I'm sure that we've got so many different best practices and lessons learned that we can actually put together. And some of, the, some of these research findings or practice finding can actually inform development of, uh, you know, solutions for people within care 12, you know, uh, younger age deal, high, high, high school age. And the project I mentioned before, um, we're actually working with students between the age of um, 16 to, to 24. Those are within high school and those who are in vocational schools as well. Um, but um, we are yet to, to try and work with younger children because we find that it's quite possibly, as a researcher, I, I find it quite difficult uh, in terms of trying to uh, provide solutions um, that will support um, uh, people of a very younger age because I believe that we need to include the social workers, we need to include the parents, and, and we need to include the different people who are actually involved in child development type thing. I wonder if you, you've got any experience in including the, the, the different stakeholders to ensure that what we are going to provide for the students or for the learners, for children would be fit fit for purpose? Um, I th from past experience, the, the college was involved in the project about seven, eight years ago called ATVET. Uh, and we looked at not so much teaching children, uh, but looking at reaching out to support staff in, in, in um, uh, junior and senior school uh, se settings. So effectively, the, um, the teaching support assistants um, and what we've realized, the, the project itself was about taking an introduction to assistive technology uh, and applying that within your professional role. So that would, uh, our, our project uh, reached out to partners in Germany, in Finland, the Republic of Ireland and in Bulgaria. Uh, and what we realized was that uh, even in what was supposed to be supposedly sort of modern and Western Europe, um, that the, the approach of enabling individuals to use assistive technologies on an, on an institutional level it, it's like the wild west that there is no formal governmental strategic um, overview um, and so kids are even even in germany and and in ireland you know we're a relatively wealthy country so children who are getting really huge amounts of support uh, really um, based on I suppose the, the enthusiasm of the people who support them and others who aren't and th I'm not decrying the people who are not providing that support it's just that they don't know what they don't know so you know, I, I, my heart goes out to you in, in, in Africa if, if this is the case in in the United Kingdom 
and, and other European countries, then you know we, we need to start that dialogue sooner rather than later. But I would also sort of emphasize the point that you need to be talking to the policymakers because having Ireland of outstanding practice, whilst we all get a warm, fuzzy feeling from it, it doesn't address the needs of the nation as a whole. Certainly just say, I mean, my experience in the UK is that, you know, the schools have come a long way, but the bar is still set very low. <laughs> yeah. And I think that the reason why things like autism and dyslexia are coming through so much, in, in, um, being di you, you, you're having far more of them going through DSA assessment centres and so on, is because it's being identified earlier. But at the same time, I mean, like my daughter's school had dyslexia friendly status, is down in Sussex. And like my is dyslexic. And um, the children in the class that were having difficulty reading, um, one of the teachers said, Well, okay, look, you know, little group here, you know, we'll take you over to one side, and those that are having difficulty reading, we'll give you some colored overlays, and these might help. And so they gave the boys blue and the girls pink. <laughs> and it's like, you think, Oh, you know, they're so nearly there, and they've completely missed it. <laughs> and it's that kind of frustration. But I think step by step they are improving, but we'd all like it to happen quicker. Yeah. Um, and it's a start. <laughs> I think we are running out of time. Um, thank you very much for being here today. And I'm sure, I hope that we will continue this discussion. So if you're interested in any of the talks, have a chat with each one of them, and then we can, we can try and sort something out in the future that will allow us longer period of time to discuss and talk about the different issues. Thank you very much. And there are some